Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Exhibition Budgery Golf Forum interview. Um, yes, tonight we are interviewing um, well-known uh, novice fancier Graham Payne, um, who's become an integral part of um, the resurgence of the, the Mid-Essex Budgery Gar Society. Uh, good evening, Graham. Evening, John. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Lovely. Well, th thank you very much for, um, for joining us this evening. Um, so, how's lockdown been for you? Is it, uh, you got through it okay? So far. I've had one test so far. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's been different. It's, it's certainly given more time with the birds, that's for certain. And uh, we've, been, we've seen lots of pictures of your lovely gardens as well during lockdown with uh, all your wonderful roses as well. So uh, um, I know you've been sharing it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share. No, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. What, what was voted? I know you did. You had a little poll. I know this is a bit slightly off topic already, but what, what was the what was the um, what was voted by your uh, your watchers online. Who? What was their favourite rose? One. It was Mocha Rosa. It was Mocha Rosa. Was it okay? Not the. What was it? it was not the oh, Army right. Corps one. No, no that, that I think in the frame. I'm afraid. Uh, that was my fault. Um. <laughs> anyway, Graham. Straight to the questions. As I say, thank you very much for for agreeing to be interviewed this evening. Um. So, how did you first get into badges? Then let's uh, start right. Take you right back to the beginning. How how did how did that all come about? Many, many years ago. Um, I think about when I was 12, um, I got told by my parents that we were going to see my auntie and uncle, who I'd never seen before in the pop. My father and I were always quite keen on the I used to go out with my dad for on a regular basis at the weekends. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was interested, but yeah, I've never, ever thought about budgerig art or, or any other form of pet before. Um, and we got up there and, of course, I got taken out to the Avery and I was, I was absolutely mesmerised by all the colours that, uh, that were on the show. Uh, because I didn't realise at the time I do now that my uncle specialised in the rare varieties, um, especially rainbows, and he had lots of clear wings. Um, and it, it was getting near the end, and he said to me, he said, would you like to take a couple home? I said, well, I'd love to, but I'd have to speak to my parents. And so he said, I think they'd be all right. So my dad, unusually, just said, yeah, as long as you look after them, you build a, uh, somewhere to keep them. He said, I'm not going to do it. It's your hobby, your, your thing. So um, I was given a rainbow hen and the most beautiful clear wing sky that I, I can still visualise that bird today because you just do not see clear wings with white wings. And th this bird's wings were pure white. So they came home and that weekend I went down to the local um, uh, wood store and I just knocked up this four by three by two wide kind of flight with a little sleeping quarter, no safety cage or anything else like that. And these two birds were sitting in there and they stayed in there for a, probably the best part of six months. And back in the 1970s and the early 70s when this was, there was budgery guards everywhere. I and mean, you only had to walk down the street and you could hear them in somebody's back garden somewhere. And my, my mum uh, said to me that one of her friends had a neighbour that was leaving and in his garden he had an aviary and he wondered whether I'd like it. Um, so I said to my dad, well, could we have it? Could I have some space at the top of the garden? And my dad, again, was really supportive. And um, we went around this guy's house and we literally carried panel by panel down the road and put it all up and in place. So that was a start. I inherited all of his birds and uh, at the same time, um, you know, an Avery to boot. So it was really exciting. But the big problem <laughs> was that I had to stand alone. I, mean, I, I came from a very humble background. My parents didn't have a lot of spare cash 
uh, to dispose with. And I had to earn the bird's keep. So I used to go around um, getting various things and selling them just to buy a budgie seat. Um, even old newspapers, I used to take them down to the garden centre and uh, they'd swap me some seed for some old newspapers, which they used to line the, uh, the plants with. So, um, yeah, then eventually I got a paper round and started to earn a bit of money and it just went on. And I kept the birds and I went right the way through until I was about 26. Um, and then I had a change in circumstances in my life and it meant the birds had to go. But in that time, I met the most wonderful mentor in a man called um, Graham. Um, now, Graham, uh, he, he showed and he was, he was really good at it. And in those days, he had some quality birds. Um, and he even used to say to me at the time, I think these birds are like telephone numbers. And I, I didn't really know what he was talking about, but of course they were hundreds of pounds in, in those days to, to, to improve his stuff. Um, so I had this, this, this really wonderful time with uh, Graham, Graham Fletcher, his name was. Um, and he taught me so much. Um, I had a, a right mishmash of birds. I never ever went into the show arena. I was I was probably a little bit intimidated by it. I, I felt a little bit shy and, and didn't feel that I would I would stand a chance. Uh, and I wouldn't have done it in those days anyway. Was there a local club that you joined? So, um, no, I didn't. Have, I didn't belong to any club at all. I used to I used to shadow Graham when he because he used to uh, go to Alexander Palace and. Uh, other places, and even stayed the night there uh, on security with him. Um, but it's 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 something I never did. It was just a hobby. It was a, it was a pleasure. I used to, I, as a young boy, I used to I used to look at a book by Cyril Rogers, and in that book there was um, a colour chart, and that colour chart would give you all the various permutations of putting a green with a yellow and, and so on and what you get and the percentages. And my ultimate aim was to, to bring a black eye clear um, because it, Cyril Rogers said you could do it, you just had to keep working the mutations and the varieties together and eventually you'd get there. I never did, but I had great fun trying. But that's, that's the one thing that really, really drove me on was the genetical side. Um, and when I came back the second time, I'd, I'd forgotten an awful lot of it. Um, but it's surprising what stays with you. And funny enough, my brother, who never really got involved with the birds, even now, if I was to show him a bird, he'd know what was an opening, what was a, a clear wing, what was a looting, no matter. And it, it's amazing that even he, was showing interest in what I was doing, even though he wasn't getting involved. So yeah, it was. Um, I, I loved the early beginning. I learned a lot. Um, I think one of the things that drove me um, to despair, even in those days, was French mold. Uh, um, it, it it really got hold of me, and it became soul destroying. And I think that helped to make the decision to get rid of the birds. To be honest with you, um, I might have might have just carried on with them if I hadn't had that issue um, and it's a shame that all those decades ago we've still got the problem to this day you think something would have been done about it by now wouldn't you how, how are you breeding the birds were you colony breeding them back then or they yeah, had their I, own no I, I started colony breeding um, um, and then I went over to selective breeding I actually um, got a few cages and uh, uh, I had a series, I think, of about six. I only had a very, very small shed, so I was very limited. Um, and then when I left home, I, um, I took the birds to my first marital home, um, built a, a great big um, uh, bird room, had one of these precast concrete uh, shed effects. Um, and from a customer who had a lot of decks in, I used that as framework to build the flight and I bolted the wire to the Dexian. So it uh, took bloody ages, but uh, it, it served its purpose. In fact, when we moved to 
house, it took us longer to dismantle the aviary than it did to actually get everything out of the house. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> oh, my God. oh, brilliant. So, OK, so you've just going back um, to those times, what were you feeding the birds? This is interesting because I know obviously we're, we're seriously supplementing the birds now. And I mean, the modern day exhibition budgery guy gets it eats so well. What, what were you feeding back then? Can you remember? Yeah, I can remember because it was, uh, it was just a, a basic 50-50 mix because bearing in mind, I didn't have much money. I, I couldn't really treat them to the likes of trill, which uh, was uh, like the Hayes food today. Um, they, they got a basic 50-50 um, and when they were rearing, I used to give them uh, brown bread and milk. Um, occasionally, they, they'd get a few groats. And other than that, it was just things out of the garden. I used to pick dandelions and um, groundsel, um, and, and that was their, their their diet, really. And they did all right. I mean, the birds, but they didn't say they were, they were more flighty. They weren't um, they weren't like the show birds of today. Uh, they were very active, and they did well. And, and were, did, were you, were you, did you find that they were popping six out, six babies out of a clutch? And yeah, it was, it was just non-stop. Yeah. Uh, I even, uh, funny enough, I even got a pair of cockatiels, um, which I put in with the, the budgets and put an S-box up for them. They kept losing their youngsters. And in the end, I put a cockatiel under a pair of budgets and they brought it up, it hatched. <laughs> they actually brought them oh, up really? and it faced with the baby budgies in there. There wasn't an awful lot of difference in size until the cockatiel grew and its tail grew and everything else. But uh, it was fantastic. And that cockatiel, to the day I got rid of it, thought it was a budgie. It never associated with the other cockatiels. Really strange. Fantastic. And, and would, is, is that, um, do you think that's part of the problem with the hobby at the minute, Pete, that, that frustration with actually breed, breeding numbers of birds and not having that, having that joy because that's one of the things I remember when I was a lad was when we were breeding them mum and I we we you just put a pair down and you had to be pretty unlucky for them almost not to breed I mean these days it's the other way around and you're lucky if a pair that looks you know that are really bouncing that really fertile go down and breed is that do you think do you think that takes a lot of fun is that what makes it such such a, an interesting challenge yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, when the birds are small, they do breed a lot easier. Um, your success is great. I mean, I used to have recessives popping out all over the place. And they were so wonderful when I used to get one of those. Uh, I haven't bred a recessive for over 30 years. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, the bigger birds are harder. I mean, this year I put down all the birds I, in my mind. I worked out what I was going to do. I think the best five pairs that I had in, on paper didn't produce a single clear, uh, a fertile egg. It was a complete disaster. Um, but then again, you'll get another pair that will just, just completely fill every egg. I don't know, John. It, it is more frustrating with, the, with show birds because uh, it, is, it is harder. Um, you get more issues, of course. They don't last as long. Um, the hens are only really for a couple of years, whereas you'll get longer out of a, um, a smaller pet type bird. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think showing puts more pressure on uh, breeders because you, you, you have to, you, you, you're trying to find that, that ultimate bird all the time and then you get disappointed when it doesn't happen and, and it might get a really good one and it dies and but when you haven't got that kind of pressure and you're breeding for the fun of it, it's lovely. You know, and you, know, you can really enjoy your hobby. Yeah, I think you're right, but that, the joy of the hobby is, is it, it's key to locking that into people, isn't it, quite at some point, so they know that that's there for them. I mean, you've only got to look at the BS. I mean, we, we have over 2,000 members thereabouts, only 500 show. So there's still... You know, three quarters of the membership are enjoying the hobby and, and getting out of it. I mean, even at my club, Mid-Essex, we've got people that don't show. But they, they really are having fun with their birds. Their family are, are all getting involved with them and, and they're enjoying them. It's, um, maybe, maybe we need to reinvent the wheel a little bit. No, I completely, I, I completely agree. Um, 
So there was no showing at back back in when in the um, in the seventies when he started. Um, so how did you return to the hobby then? That's uh... oh, oh, John, it's been in my blood all those years. I, I, it's, been, it's been like a dinosaur waiting to hatch. <laughs> I've literally gone through agonies. Um, my wife is really anti uh, any animals being caged, or um, she likes everything to be free. And she said that, you know, she couldn't bring it upon herself to actually see those birds in, in that type of environment, um, all caged up and basically us playing with nature, what has got. So I just accepted it um, until one very weak moment out in Mexico uh, where we were walking around a, a wildlife park. And my daughter, who was, I think, about 13, 14 at the time, she was absolutely mesmerised by some scarlet macaws. And um, she said, oh, Daddy, I'd, I'd love one of those. And I said, oh, we couldn't, Mummy wouldn't let us have anything like that. I said, but what about a buttery gun? <laughs> she said, oh, that sounds interesting. I said, well... If mummy thinks that you might like it, um, and in the end, my wife just said, I'll go on then. And it was only when I was, it was only when I built the flight, she came out and she said, isn't that a little bit excessive for two birds? <laughs> hey, go on, just for anyone watching, how big's that flight, Graham? <laughs> yeah, uh, five metres by, by four metres, um, basically. It's, it's quite big. <laughs> So she did quite, your, your, your lovely wife wasn't quite aware of what was coming next, was, was she? Or, well, I suppose that was a bit of... Uh, I mean, she, she really has got very strong views about, about what, what we do as a hobby. Um, yeah, I'm lucky. I mean, she leads me to it, but it, she doesn't like it. But I imagine, I mean, my wife doesn't like the birds either, but I think she realises that um, the amount of love and, and effort that goes into caring for those those animals that, or the creatures as she calls them down the garden. So uh, it's not like we just cage them up and leave them for days in the dark, do we? So I think they have a fine existence. Um, so, okay, so you've got the, the mega flight and your bird room. Um, how did you, so did you, you, where did you go to get, get well, some this, birds? Then? This was my big problem. And I, I actually think this is, the problem that I encountered back in 2014, I think is still prevalent today. I didn't know where to go, John. And that was the honest answer. I had, I knew I had to build everything first. So I had all the, the, the aviary done and it was all nice, but I had no birds. And I just didn't know what to do. I went on the internet and I couldn't find for whatever reason, I couldn't find anybody that was local. You know, go back 30, 40 years, as I said to you, every street had a had a, a, a an aviary, but all of a sudden it, there was a void. And I didn't even think about the Budgery Gar Society. Uh, I the, the one thing that came to my memory was Cage Burton Aviaries, um, because I used to get that periodical even back in those days. And I was flicking through it and on page two was an article by a guy, uh, or about a guy called Gerald Binks, who I, I didn't know who he was. And Gerald was um, uh, in the throes of having to uh, get rid of his birds because of illness. Um, and he was inviting people to come along and, and uh, to uh, perhaps take, take birds and, you know, so I thought, well, let's strike while the arm's hot. So I, I made the phone call and, and Gerald said, yeah, pleased to see you. And uh, we, we set a date to come down. And then also within the, um, uh, the paper was an article by Clive Walkerman. Is it Walkerman? Walkerman down in the West Country. Uh, yeah. Violets. And I, I really liked the thought of getting some violets. And... I read all the way through it, but I couldn't see a contact number. But there was the only number there was for a guy called Brian Sweeting. I mean, I'm, I'm acting all kind of naive here because that's how it was for me at the time. 
And um, I, I, I rang Brian and I said, have you, have you got any birds available? Uh, you know, I'm saying you keep the pilots. He said, well, I, I don't. Clive does, but he hasn't got any. But you're welcome to come down. Um, and so I more or less set myself up to go to two breeders um, to buy some birds. So um, my daughter and I went down to uh, Tanglewood and, uh, with uh, Gerald Binks and his, his lovely wife. And it was such a sad occasion because this man, you know, who everyone knows has been so, he, he was the, the budgie world for so many years. And we were starting when he was finishing and his wife just couldn't, you know, she just fell to pieces as we were getting ready to take the birds out. But that man could not have helped me more. Um, he gave us a copy of the, the Budger Gar, which I still think to this day is probably one of the finest uh, editorial that you can buy. Um, he, his birds, I mean, I was surprised how dear birds were, I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but we didn't know any difference, so we just, you know, we, we, we bought what we did. Um, and I think I bought 10 birds, and then he said, look, you need some more. He said, but don't use these ones for breeding. He said, these are just to make a bit of noise in the flight while the others are breeding. So he put five birds up for us. And um, he, he said to me and, and Rebecca, uh, which one of those birds do you think are the best? And I pointed out a, a cinnamon sky that I, I bought. And he said, yeah, you're right, that is the best. He said, uh, I'm assuming you're having that one then. I said, well, yeah, I was rather hoping so, yeah. He said, well, we can't have that, can we? So he went round the back and he came out with this, uh, this light green cock, which um, had a little bit of opalescence, but my God, it was heaven's shoulders above everything else. I, th I didn't even see it in there. I don't know where it had come from. And he said, this is for Rebecca and this will do you very well. Um, and anyway, so we, we, we left and we, we came away with lots of seed and everything because obviously he didn't need anything. So I think the last few birds were going all the way out to Cambodia, believe it or not. Really? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we got the birds home and uh, yeah, it was amazing. And then we, uh, we went down to Brian Sweeting, same thing again, lovely man, and uh, couldn't have made us more at home. Came away with some gorgeous birds. And uh, yeah, that was the start. Um, but but I, I, I did feel very, um, very lonely as much that I just couldn't find, it. there wasn't enough out there, you know, to, to, to let people know of the hobby. And, and there was me really biting at the bit, trying to get going, and I just didn't know where to go. Um, obviously, being an older age group, I'm not as good on the internet as perhaps younger people would be today. But you need to make allowances for that. Yeah. So. But you did well. Get, I mean, you couldn't have gone to two better breeders, could you? I mean, even if you weren't aware who they were. I mean, John, I didn't know why, where I was going or who I was going to. And yet, in hindsight, I did very, very well. And in fact, um, my, 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 my early successes came with a pipeline, a pipeline came from the old Borch had from Gerald Beach, the black green, and a, a sky a cinnamon pie from Brian Sweeting. And that pair produced us some fantastic pies. And I did so well with them. So, so well. That's so I got a message about my internet being unstable. Is it all right? Is, you still hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you okay. It goes, it's, it's gone a bit crackly a couple of times, but yeah, you're okay, mate. You're okay mostly. So, yeah, so that, that was it. I mean, that, that, that's where we really got going. Um, um, and I mean, Brian's birds are still revered to this, this day. And it's, when you go into his shed, you, you can't help but just <laughs> open your mouth and your eyes go like goldfish bowls. There are just some amazing birds he's got there. Have you been back to Brian's Sweetings for any more? Or? Went back um, about a year later. Um, but thereafter, his birds were in so much demand, I, I just didn't have a prayer. Um, 
yeah. So, but I, you know, I, I've had my 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 initial birds were founded on that. I mean, Gerald Binks, with all the advice he gave. I mean, one of the things that he he said is that you really uh, don't want to really mix lots of different bloods into your birds when you're trying to start a foundation because otherwise all you're going to have is a flock of birds and not a bloodline. He said these these breeders that have established strong lines have spent loads of money, loads of time, loads of effort to get where they have. So the last thing you want to do is dilute it all. So work with two, maybe three bloodlines and create something of your own, bring in a bit of fresh blood from time to time, but don't just get this one from there and another one from somewhere else, because at the end, you know, you, 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 you're not really working with anything not properly. So that was one uh, set of advice. And, and the other, which I thought was extremely uh, strange comment to me, I didn't, didn't really quite twig what he was saying at the time, but he said, just because a champion is a champion, it doesn't mean that he's got champion birds. So you will often find that going to another beginner or a novice or an intermediate, you can buy good birds at good prices for better than what you get by going to some of the champion breeders. I understand what he meant now since I've been involved in the, in the show scene. But and I think, Ger I think Gerald was always really good with his time as well, wasn't he? I know the couple of top oh. occasions I went, he, you, were, you were there for hours. You, there was never any pressure really to, to get to, oh, to oh, leave. Oh, 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 without an accident on the motorway, we were there so long. He, he was so accommodating. He really was. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm sure, I'm sure he loved helping someone new in the hobby as well, particularly for a well, so time. When he, that he was leaving, we were coming. So it was, you know... It was, it was nice. It was a nice moment. Good. Um, so at, at that point, you've got your great big fly, you've got your bird shed um, and, and your bird room. You don't use loads of breeding cages, do you? How, how many have you got? Can you tell us, please? Well, I've, I've got 11 uh, now, but I started with just nine. I had to create space for two more because I did find that having just the nine was very restrictive. Um, it does change the way that you, you have to think. Um, I've often got far more birds in the flight than I can ever use. Um, but, you know, you, you, you look, you know, I've got to get that one down, and I've got to get that one down. And then you suddenly realise that you've got to get 20 pairs down, but you've only got 11 cages. So you really then have to think about it and, and really work at what's going to do you best and give you, give you the best results. Um, yeah, it's it, it's hard, but at the same time, it's far more manageable. Um, I don't know how you guys with twenty plus cages cope with it. I mean, the, the maintenance side alone is, and the cleaning takes so much time. And is that something beginners attract beginners fall into? Do they go too sometimes go too large too quickly with their setups? Because this is yeah. the problem. When you, when you walk into Gerald Binks's and others and you see these massive bird rooms, you think, well, they look good. I'll have one of those. Well, if you can afford one or you try, try and do it on a, most of us try and do it on a, a kind of budget, but you, you think bigger, don't you? But, but, but I, was, you, I, was, I was in awe. I mean, Gerald had over 60 cases, I think. And then when I went to Daniel Lutoff, he had over 100. You know, it's, it's just phenomenal. But I, 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 I just don't think it's, it's necessary. I mean, what do we do with all these birds? And this, and this is the problem. You know, well, no one's buying them at the minute, are they? <laughs> I mean, obviously, some some breeders uh, uh, have a demand um, because of their their success and, and the way they, their birds look. But the majority of people they struggle to get rid of their birds. And I suppose when you've got eleven cages, you're 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 always focused on best all the time, aren't you? I said. I know we. I, I fall. I fall into the trap of trying to use the lesser brothers of my best birds and lesser sisters. But I suppose if I if you take those out like you've done, and you've 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 had more success than I have, and we've been at a similar level for some time now, and 
but and and but you've and I always think that you're you're far more focused than I am because of perhaps because of the cages and probably because you're more level headed than I am, but <laughs> but uh, more sensible. But that, I don't one minute. I mean, obviously, what you you've also got to bear in mind. I do tinker with a few rare varieties, and mm. that comes at a sacrifice because when you're working with other varieties your mainstream birds have got less opportunities to get into a breeding cage. Because um, just to give a, um, uh, a bit more sort of clarity on that, do you, you, so you're talking about your easily clear bodies, aren't you, which you've done? Well, I am, but I've had no success with those at all this year. I've only bred one and it died. Um, yeah. But it's not through lack of, of effort. I've had about three pairs down so far, but it just hasn't worked. But... Um, yeah, easily. Uh, that came about a, a show that my daughter and I did in 2015. Um, and we were walking by and my daughter said, oh, look at that lovely bird. That's an unusual blue colour. And it, it looked like a slate. And uh, I asked someone, they said, well, that's an, an ECB. And uh, we found out who the owner was. And I, I went up and I said, is, is there any chance that... Um, you, you might be able to spare one. And uh, she said, yeah, come to the next you know, show and I'll bring one along for you. I think it was only £25. So you know, we came away and my daughter was really happy. And it just sat in the flight because I didn't really know what to do with it. And, and it, it was just like um, one step on from a pet bird, really. Um, and I might as well carry on the story while I'm, I'm going on here. Yeah, no, um, please, no. Yeah, I mean, where it all went. I mean... A very good friend of mine, Estehan Anwar, or Ash to his, his, uh, his friends, um, came to me one day and he said, he said, um, would you like a, a Mike Ball bird? I said, well, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind. He said, well, I'll give it to you. I said, it's very generous of you. He said, well, it hasn't got a ring. Um, he said, but it is a Mike Ball bird. He said, but, um, you know, if it can do you some good, so I said, well, thank you. It, it wasn't anything particularly striking, not when you look at what Mike's birds normally are. Um, this bird was, was okay, but it was, and I just put it in the flight, and one day I saw that it paired up with the easily. So I had a spare cage, and I put it in, and um, I think I've got five youngsters off the third round, and three of them were easelys. And one of them was an absolute stonker. Um, and the, uh, that was a hen bird. And the cock birds, funny enough, um, have won the uh, CCs at uh, various shows. Both, both the, the two cock birds did extremely well, beating um, Texas clear bodies in the process, which is no mean feat. Um, and it was all down to this, this chance, chance pairing, the bird that uh, was given to me. So, yeah, I, I, I put something good into the easels and it went on from there. And I've got a, a really lovely hen that came back off of it. Um, and it's encouraged me now to put my better birds to my rarer varieties to really try and boost them along. Um, I said this year's been a bit of a damp squib, but uh, I'll, I'll be at it again next year. Yeah. Uh, there's still time to get them to breed, isn't there? They'll well, there is, but I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very lucky that I've been able to share my love around. So I've, I've, I've bred quite a few over the, the years, and there's, there's a few breeders now around the country that have, have got my easelies. Um, I mean, Ricky uh, Anderson has, has done really well with them. I think he might even be possibly looking at double factor, which is really exciting, it's something we've both been trying to get. Um, so I know if I need to get any back, I can get some from Ricky. It's all, it's all the same bloodline linked. So, um, and being a dominant variety, you only need one. You don't have to wait. They can pop out just like that. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, much better than the Texas clear bodies. Don't mess around with them. They're, <laughs> they're, they're far too much work. Although settings variety, you like the you like your lace rings as well. I know you've bred some. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've bred I, some good ones. I've always liked um, red eyes, but never had them. Um, and so I got in touch with uh, Sam Wilds and 
I asked him if he had anything available. And at the time, um, all he had was um, a, um, it was a yellow post, uh, open and grey um, split uh, cock. So um, I had that from Sam. And I did a little um, uh, swap with somebody and got hold of a, a yellow face white uh, lace wing, which I never got around to using. But again, I, um, I lent her out to James Foley and he put one of his split like green lace wing uh, cocks to her. And they got two rounds and we, we just split the chips between us. And I, I actually got back some visuals and from those visuals, I paired one of the hens to the Sam Wilde's cock, and I've read the most amazing cock bird um, in 2019. Unfortunately, he died at six months old. In fact, you may remember seeing him at the um, Maidstone yeah. uh, show. He was, he was he stunning. Was something else. He really, really was. But I've, I've got siblings of his, but they're all hens. And so... Next year, my plan is to, to really work with those. I've bred lots of splits this year. I say lots, I've got about four or five, but that's a lot for me. Um, so I fully intend to blend it all in. Um, I also um, I was very fortunate a few years ago to uh, win a Mike Ball grey cock in, in a raffle. Um, and that bird has bred and bred for me. And I've even introduced that into my lace wings as well. So I'm really quite excited as to what the future holds. So fingers crossed, lace wings, here we come. Oh, and I bred my first uh, Lutino this year as well. And I'll bring a first one. Tell us about that years. Lutino as well, because I know, I know a bit about this, but this, the Lutino is a bit special, isn't it? Oh, the head is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't, I'm so excited. Um, it's probably the best bird I've bred this year. And again, it's all by chance. Um, it came about, I, went, I had a visit to uh, Bluetooth. Uh, his prices are, are quite expensive. Um, and so I had a bit of a gamble. I, I went for some bar heads, um, and these were reasonably priced. Um, and when I paired one of the great green cocks to one of my um, Violet Sky hens, uh, violet, uh, like green hens, suddenly I started getting red eyes out. I um, was completely blown away by it. And I started to breed Lutinos and I'd even have an albino out as well. And uh, I think in three rounds, I must have had about eight hatch. Unfortunately, I, I've only got three that survived. Um, but I'm really quite excited for what I'm going to be doing next year. Because I can obviously link the albinos and the lace wings, mix and match a little bit. I know it's frowned upon, but it can be done. So, yeah, I mean, um, so you've got plenty of options anyway for next year. Yeah, so. I have. Yeah, it's quite exciting. Quite yeah, exciting. It's, interesting that, it's interesting Daniel Lutov sells. Um, I've not had the pleasure of going just yet, although it's sort of on, my, on my bucket list. But I've heard he sells bar heads and they are cheaper. But I was... It staggers me that a breeder like him, and I, I'm just interested to know why he does it this way. Um, I suppose he knows which which bar heads are going to he wants to keep from quite an early stage, but you don't really know what it what almost what you're buying, do you? They could come on no, or not. Or... You, don't. you don't. I mean, yeah, it was a gamble. Uh, I just took the the decision that he doesn't keep any birds in his breeding stock, which are not really highly visual. Um, he's only breeding with the best stuff, so consequently, anything that's being produced, in my mind, is coming from a background of, of, of good birds. Um, and you know, whether it's it's the Daniel connection or whether it was the hen that I put put into, and she was no pushover. This Lutino hen is amazing. You know, it was, it's, it's a typical modern day bird. It's full of feather. And she, I, I, I think she's a She's she's really active. She's not like one of these birds that sits on the floor and you know she's flying about. And I'm really really quite excited about the prospect. 
Brilliant. So that that will be in cage number one when you repair again. Uh, something. The first one. I, 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 I'm not breeding at the moment. I've wound everything down, um, and I, I probably won't start until next year now. Um, but she will be one of the first birds in. So we've spoken before about breeding, and obviously you and I have both tried to breed to the to the ring date, um, well, the, uh, the, which is now obviously slightly earlier, only a, a week or so away, um, or a couple of weeks away. Do you, when have you had your best successes with, since you've come back to the hobby with birds, in the summer breeding or? Oh, the autumn? I mean, this, this is why I, I, I think that we live in a past time and we are far more uh, knowledgeable and, well, I think it's ignorance, really, that, that plagues the, 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 the Bhattaragal world um, and tradition. I mean, you've only got to think about the wild birds, apart from pigeons, of course, when do they breed? They're not breeding in December or November. They're breeding in the springtime. And I think if most people were honest, most breeders have more success when they breed in the spring leading into the summer than they do when they, they try in the winter. Because you're, you're battling with humidity, you're battling with you know, the cold it's it's i mean i would not be stuck in a cage <laughs> it's not exactly the best environment for them is it but even and with I, think, heat I think we need to change the way that we're doing things i think we need to think about the welfare think about the membership because obviously if we're going to breed more birds and have more success albeit maybe a shorter period of time but we're doing it at a time that Show in the winter time. It, to my mind, it, it, it just it just don't need to. Um, and that's why I, I'm really not bothered. I, I, I've, I've had enough of it now. Um, I want to let the the, the the cold, damp weather go, and I'll start breeding in the early spring. That's that's how I feel. Early ring date or not, I'm not. And and have you just arrived at that this year? This is a new thing from here on in. Is it is taking a few? Um, it gets excited when you put your birds first down, you're waiting for eggs, constantly checking if you've got fertility and everything else. Yeah, it is exciting, but it comes with it at a cost. And I don't think it's that successful. Um, and I hear so many other breeders saying the same thing. And then you, you hear people that are doing it on a pleasure basis and they're breeding in the, the early part of the year, the spring. They do really well. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, if I get one or two for the show season, I get one or two. If I don't, I'm not going to be too worried. I'm, this, I just want... So I was going to say, this whole lockdown has allowed us to be, allow us to try other things as well, isn't it? I think, you know, potentially we might not have a show season next year. Maybe, mate, you know, if we can get one, it'll be quite late on. In the back of my mind, John, that's that's already there. I think um, it's going to be you know, touch and go whether whether we do or we don't. Um, and I want this, it's, this is a golden opportunity for me to try mm. something else. Um, I'm always trying different things and looking at ways of improving things and conditions, et cetera. Um, and I just want a bit of a break from it because it is, it's a long, hard season um, and it's time consuming. And I'm going into my shed now and I'm feeding them, giving them all fresh water. I'm in and out within 15, 20 minutes. I used to be in there for over an hour, two hours sometimes with all the breeding cages, having to keep them clean. It's, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a little bit of a break now. And again, it's a break when, logically, you don't really want to be in the shed, do you? You want to be in your nice warm house with, with your feet up enjoying Christmas, not uh, not necessarily have, try to top birds up because the adults don't want to feed because they know it's cold outside. And, uh, that's right. That's right. Exactly. No, so, um, right. So, so with, with your outdoor flight, what's, what's the... What's the, the 
the um, the real main advantage of having an outdoor flight? Well, I, I think really birds need to keep their, their calcium levels topped up. Um, I know we give them lots of um, additives, we give them grits, we give them cuttlefish, but they're basically carbonates anyway. They take longer to break down to get into their, their bodies. They don't need an awful lot, but we're expecting a lot of them. I mean, if we're putting a hen in, into a breeding cage, we're often giving a two or three rounds, and that's a lot of calcium. I mean, they only hold a certain amount in their body. Um, whereas if they're outside, they only need about 30 minutes of, of sunlight to recharge their batteries up to full. So I think the, the having them out there and being able to, you know, go up against the wire and get themselves wet when it's raining and have a proper bath with, with rainwater, I think it's fantastic. And then on a windy day, they love a windy day. They love flying in the wind and, and sitting there and rocking about and, and skitting all over the place. It's, it's just so nice to see as well. With, with your birds in their outdoor flight, do they spend much time on the ground in your flights? I know you've got kind of a decked floor. Do they? They go down because often bits of wood or things, I mean, budgies are inquisitive creatures. You know they are. And if they see a stone or something, they, they go down and pick it up. They will go down and forage around, but most of the time is spent on the, on the perches, to be honest with you. Yeah, there's just a, that's the reason I ask, is that normally when you're in an indoor flight, they, birds seem to spend more time on the ground, but in the outdoor flights, they do they do sit high, don't they? And um, I just wondered whether, whether you found, found that as well. Um, so what's the best piece of kit in your bird room then, Graham? What would you, uh, you I, not try new things I, as you say? What's... Well, I think the, 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 the most important thing that I've had put in is an extractor pad. Um, because obviously the more birds you have, the more dust you create. Um, that dust I have found detrimental to my own health to the point where I've actually started wheezing when I'm, when I'm sleeping. Uh, I've overcome that now with the, the fan. Um, and also I, I mask up uh, when I go in there for any length of time. Um, I'm now going to have a second fan installed in a slightly different position so that I'm taking the majority of the dust directly from the flight, the in, internal flight where the birds are there. Uh, and I'll have another one coming across the breeding cages, but I'll keep that at lower rev revolutions. Um, yeah, it's, the fan is definitely the thing because prior to that, you could walk into my, my bird room and you could actually taste the dust in the air. Um, it was commented on by several people. But now you go in there and it's, it's a much fresher environment. And if it's healthier for me, it's got to be healthier for the birds. It's an absolute must. And your bird, I was having been to your bird a few times, it's always very clean and neat and tidy, but it's interesting that you say that you know, the, 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 the particles, the dust particles, are so small you can taste them. You obviously can't see them, of course. But it's, uh, I'm glad that, uh, but that you found that that's um, uh, a good solution to that problem. And I, I know a few years ago people were using air vac sort of internal sort of fans to to suck the air in. But now you you do favour those those kind of wall mounted ones, don't you? Yeah. That just drag it straight out. I, I think by the time, if you were to look at the fan, I, I, I clean my fan fairly regularly. I take it completely apart, clean all the blades and all the housing, and you wouldn't believe how thick the dust gets in there in such a short period of time. Um, even when the fan's on the lowest speed, um, you, you can see the build up uh, of the dust on, on the plate itself. So um, it's a massive amount of dust they create. Uh, I think it's more than perhaps some people realise. And I've only got a very small shed. It's only eight by ten. So, and I've got a lot of birds in there. You know, if, at the night time, of course, the majority come inside. So they're all in there then. Uh, you're in there in your... yeah. Okay, okay, that's good. I th thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so when, when you choose an outcross, how, how do you go about 
choosing an outcross when you, when you go shopping for new birds? It depends on what I'm looking for, John. Um, I mentioned earlier that I went to that wild specifically for a, a bird that I knew would help me from a, my lace wing. Um, I went back once I knew about Brian Sweeting because he had the directional uh, feathering that I wanted to, to push. Um, you know, from time to time, I will bring uh, other birds in just to freshen things up a little bit, but I try not to go too mad. Um, I mentioned I've got, I've got a few birds from, from Luton, um, and they're starting to do quite well. I've, I've read some nice stuff from them. Um, but I'm, I don't know. It's, uh, I think sometimes you, you, you just have to, um, look at what you are trying to achieve. And if you can't achieve it from what you've already got within your own makeup, then you need to look outside uh, and try and bring that factor in. And, and and what kind of bird are you trying to create at the minute? That kind of led, led very nicely to my next question. Are you? What is your ideal budgie? I know everyone's got their own sort of little yeah. take on it. What, what's yours? I must admit, I, li I like a bird to have a lot of feather, but at the same time, I think too much feather compromises styling. Um, and classic example for me was at the club show last time around. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at birds that others have seen to be, you know, top birds. But in my mind, they weren't stylish. There were other birds that were far more stylish. You looked at them and they had the wow factor. I'd like to get my birds back to more of the... You know, what you see is the typical showbird. I want to see that ice cream cone kind of head. Yeah, still get the still get the direction, but I want to see it controlled. I mean, there's a few breeders on the on the, on the circuit at the moment that are starting to introduce birds like that. Um, I think it looks so much nicer than seeing all these feathers coming out all over the place. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I'm working on at the moment, and I've got one or two coming through like it. So it's 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 work in progress, but style is is the key as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, so, okay, so just, just uh, take a step back. So you've started breeding with with your daughter Rebecca, and you've had a season. Did um, we've done well? Did you at this point? Did you think we need to join a club or there must be. No, we didn't. Uh, I, I, um, I didn't start showing until I had joined a club. Okay. Um, I, I basically got our first birds in 2014, and I felt that I needed to share the hobby more rather than just do it. I, I bought these exhibition birds, and realistically, I needed to get into showing. But it, again, it was a question of finding. Um, the right place to, to act as a platform. Um, so I, again, went to Cajun Avery, went through all the um, notices, uh, club notices, and I saw Mid-Essex in there. And uh, I can't remember how it came about. I think I made a phone call to a number that was there and they just said, turn up, and I did. Um, I think it was because it was late and Rebecca had school that day. She couldn't come with me. So um, we ca I came along and uh, that was in 2014, but it was late in the year. It was almost, um, I think it was about October, November time. Uh, so I didn't show that year. But my, my first year of showing was, was really in 2015. Um, and I think realistically, we, I think we only showed at Mid-Essex and a couple of others uh, in our first year. Um, did all right. It was all very new. But, um, and 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 at Mid Essex at the time, how many members did they have? Because I know they've, you know, the club's grown and grown in in recent years. But they, how big were they at that point? When I was there, there was uh, at the meetings probably about 10, 11 people. Um, occasionally, the numbers would get swollen where uh, Ipswich members would come along to join the evening. 
Um, but so in the end, it, 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 as time went by, it switched and was fade away. Um, and it just became people. But the, the club had grown immensely, as you know, over 40 members now. And that, I mean, and so when you joined, were Ricky and, and James Folly there and, and Ian? No, so, uh, when I joined, James was there. Ricky wasn't. I didn't even know who Ricky was at that point. Um, Ian, uh, Alan, there's there several people, obviously. There, there was a core uh, group of, of people. Um, and they were just, they just concluded... I think it was in 2014, they, they had a patch and show me, and they got 260 uh, benches on uh, on the 2015, which meant they, they then went up to uh, bronze, well, they got bronze, and then they got silver the following year. So I think I think I came on the scene, really, start showing uh, the first silver show, um, which I think was 2016, from memory. How did you get on in your first show season? Did you do well or you did okay? Yeah, did really well. Did really well. Because, I, and, you know, as I said, we had this lovely pipeline. We did, did fantastic with those. And um, I, we, we did, I mean, Rebecca I, had very little competition. So she more or less won every, every time out. And uh, I did very well uh, in the beginning section. I think even in my in the first show year, I even got the uh, best young bird in show at High Wickham, which was uh, a massive really? achievement. Excellent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, a huge achievement. Fantastic. So, so that, so at that point, once you've, you've done a bit of winning and you've, you've enjoyed the competition, that, that kind of spurred you, which has encouraged you, it spurred you on. So you, you've also joined the BS. Did you join the BS at that point? Uh, yeah, I joined the BS um, back in 2014. So I had the rings for 15. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, so how, how did you how did you end up becoming sort of really involved in Mid Essex then? Because obviously, for those who don't know, there's a core of four or five of you, or um, who who are really heavily involved in, in in driving that club forward. How did you uh, did you get pressed into action, or you're? No, I think I mean Mid Essex was a very it was and and still is a very relaxed. Uh, laid back club. Um, it's a mixture of, of uh, ages and, and uh, abilities, and um, it, it it came to me uh, the AGM at, uh, in two thousand and fifteen um, when we were discussing you know, the various things that happened, and, and one of them was the the show. Had been a magnificent success, and obviously we were heading for silver the following year. But they didn't make any money; uh, they actually lost money on the show. And I just, I, I was just starting to feel, find my feet a little bit in the club, and it didn't, it wasn't getting too involved. And I just said, "How can we lose money on the show?" And I said, "Don't know, really. We just didn't make any money." And I said, "But did we get any sponsors?" <laughs> Perhaps we missed a trick there. And I thought, oh, this is, the, the, you know, there's something we can do here. I said, look, would anyone mind if, if I was to try and do something to, to raise the profile, raise money, sponsorship, whatever you like? They said, well, if you'd like to become sponsorship secretary, then yes. So I was given the position there and then. Um, and I just... I, I come from a sales background. I've got my own business. And so I, I've got a little bit of a, a drive when it comes to things like that. And I was on a mission there because I, I felt a bit stupid all of a sudden. I, I've made this kind of commitment. And I'm, I'm thinking, are they just going to sit there and watch me fall? Or am I going to have to try and prove myself here? So I went out and uh, it was quite a difficult task at first because I didn't know who to go to, where to go to, or, or what. And I just picked up again the Cajun Avery and started going through all the, the various companies that were advertising and got rebuked quite a few times because obviously people get pestered by everybody. Um, but in the end, um, I think we raised uh, sponsorship for over a thousand pounds, which 
you know, most clubs could kind of dream of that kind of money. And we decided to move the whole, the whole concept of the show. We tried to make it a little bit more upmarket. Um, we wanted to try and give a, an image to try and get to goal. Um, and so we had a, like a football program, we spent um, quite a bit of time doing that. Fortunately, my brother was a printer, so he did all the artwork, did everything for us. It, it didn't cost us anything. And that model that we had then um, has been taken on today and with Ricky's um, know-how and ability he's able to keep it going and improve it. And uh, it's still probably one of the, 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 the best show schedules around. Um, so yeah, we were, we, were, we were off and running. We, uh, we, we got the money in and uh, we started to raise the profile of the club. And I, I suppose that, that gave me encouragement, more enthusiasm. But in the back of my mind, um, I already had ideas that I was I was going through um, because I wanted to raise money for the club. I, I really wanted to try and get to a point where we could get new staging, where we could we could we could start to move forward, create a better profile for ourselves, encourage people in, because people like success. And if, if the club's going to be successful, people want to be part of it. Generally. Absolutely. So um, I said to James Foley, I said, look, I've got an idea going around in my head about a raffle. Uh, I, I really want to do a raffle. He said, well, we do a raffle at the show. I said, no, I, I want to I want to involve the whole country. I said, but I'm absolutely Jurassic when it comes to computers. I need help. I've got, I've got the desire. I've got the, the whereabouts. I know what I want. I just need to put it into place. And he said, well, he said, I've got a guy called Ricky who um, he used to be a member of the club and you know, maybe we can ask him to come back and, and get involved. He said that you know, he knows all about computers. He said, I'll, I'll set it up and you can have a word with him. And you know how it is. When, you, when, you, when you're full of enthusiasm, you're just waiting for someone to say no you know, and, and dampen, dampen. But as I was starting to talk it through, I was talking to Ricky. I said, well, can we do this? And can we do that? And he was like a man from Del Monte. It was yes, yes. <laughs> now he's going to say no. <laughs> he's going to say yes. I said, well, how do we do it? He said, well, you do your bit and I'll do my bit. And that's, that's basically how it all evolved. And um, it, it's got better and better as time has gone on. But I mean, I think in the first year we we sold over a thousand raffle tickets. Thousand and sixty-three comes to mind. Um, maybe wrong. And you know, for a show raffle, who, who sells that many tickets? And that then got us kind of getting a bit more excited about it because I, in the very first one we had two birds and nine other prizes, and we were really fortunate that we had uh, the, the seed. Uh, people like uh, Versalar, not Versalar, uh, they, they've come in since, but we had um, uh, Countrywide and um, uh, Buckton's and, 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 and a few other people coming on board. And we managed to maintain them the next year, but I said to Ricky, I, I want to open it up a bit. I want to put more birds in there because we only had two birds. Mm. Um, and they were top breeders. We had David Wallen and we had uh, Connor Hickman. Um, and I said, well, I want to put some more birds in. And uh, a lot of people said, well, you start having all these prizes, you're going to dilute it. You know, you're not going to necessarily make any more money because there's only so much money. And you know how people get, you know, kind of, um, they try and play things down. And I want to race. I, I'm, I'm really starting to go. And I can't remember how many prizes we, we came up with in the end, but the, the, the birds certainly went up a cob. And once again, it, it blew us away with the response uh, and how well we did. Um, and it's just gone from strength to strength. Um, I mean, as, as you probably know, we're, um, we, we sold nearly 7,000 tickets in the 2019 uh, raffle. Um, and don't get me wrong, Mid-Essex has done very well out of this. I mean, we, we, we did it in partnership people that 
to support us and on offer a 50 50 basis and out of our 50 percent we we cover all the delivery we um pay for all the fees so it, it wasn't all take 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 um but we we have done very well and so this year um when the opportunity arose the committee decided to open it up to other clubs um as a way of giving them an opportunity to have a revenue source. Um, the only stipulation that we put is that any prize had to have a kind of like a street value, face value of hundred pounds to bring it in line with everything else that was going to be in within the raffle. And, you know, we've got four weeks to go on this raffle and we're doing very, very well. I'm hoping these clubs are going to do well out of it as well. There's 12 clubs that have come in and this is the first time that, um, Anything like this has, has been staged where clubs have unified and we're all working together as one. And those clubs will get all the money that their birds or their prizes generate. But that's, I mean, that's usually generous in Mid-Essex. And I mean, you know, it's, and, and again, as you say, that, that collaboration is amazing. You know, I wonder if this could, clubs can begin to collaborate in other ways, you know, other than in, in other novel ways, perhaps beyond this raffle. So it's uh, hopefully you've start you've started something that's uh, that's uh, that's a model for, for say other ways of uh, banding together to sort of push and promote and grow the hobby. Because I think this is the only way that clubs will survive in the future is if we work together. Um, if you if you if you live on tradition and you try and live in the past, you're, you're going to die with the clubs. I think the clubs have got, you know, we, we've got to be realistic about it. You know, this, we've got a lovely hobby and we need to embrace it and we need to work together at it. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to happen if clubs keep losing members and they get smaller and smaller. It's all going to fizzle away. And so just, just to, so people, people can fully understand, so mid essence of have obviously got this model. They've made plenty of money to put them in, 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 into um, a healthy financial position. You've also bought some... Um, you've got a trailer with lots of new staging. You got to that point, didn't you, as well as some other bits. Um, but, but that's allowed you to, to have free entry, I think, to the shows as well. Isn't, isn't that correct? Yeah, Which... I, mean, I mean, obviously, I am finding it harder to get sponsorship as the years tick on. Sure. Uh, but... The raffle has helped to subsidise the show, and um, for the last three years, I think we we put up a thousand and twenty pound in prize money. We've been very very fortunate that a um, hundred pound of that has been donated by Birdwise uh, every time. So effectively, the club still have to find nine pounds, but it's it's obviously less. But it means that every section. Um, well, when there were five sections, every section had uh, up to seventy-five pound in prize money. So that's the the um, number and the NEA. So one hundred and fifty could be uh, by any one one individual in in, in an ace. So um, phenomenal, and also had that same kind of money. And, you know, I used to feel so sorry for my my daughter when. She'd go up and she'd collect winners' prize of two pounds. And I think, really? You know, these kids have still got the same cost that the adults have got. Well, why should they be, you know, considered any differently? But, you know, that's the way it is. So Mid Essex decided to um, use the money that we generated to, to give people uh, as a gesture. And it, it's worked really well. Um, we have achieved something that we were told by senior um, members of the BS that would never happen, and that's that we generate a gold show. Um, and we were told by the actors of our board of the sea, um, and we proved them all wrong. You've just got to make things attractive. You've just got to try and give people a reason to come. You know, it's not, you know, a lot of the people that were coming to our show were traveling from the, the, the South Coast, from the Midlands, because they wanted to be part of an exciting event, not just a, a drab old thing that's going to rumble on. Well, and, and, and again, you know, I know 
when I attended the other year, um, you, you've had speakers, haven't you, during the judging? I know I, I sat in well, on Chris, Chris Nell's um, lecture, his, his talk, which was fantastic during judging. I think when, when you're trying to organise a show um, and you've got limited space, the last thing you want is people milling around. And you must know, you've, you've been to the years where you, you get people that they're not helping, i.e. they're not stewarding, um, and they're just standing, watching, lurking, and they're getting in everybody's way. Um, but they, it's not their fault. They've got nothing else to do. You know, they're, they're not offered anything. So we, we made a conscientious decision to restrict the stewarding to the numbers that were healthy for the hall and for the, the judging, to allow it to manoeuvre and, and move as quick as possible. And then we said, we'll get a speaker in um, and we hire an additional hall and people were able to go along and sit down and, and be absolutely wowed. And we, we, we had some cracking speakers over the last uh, few shows that we've done. It's really worked well. I think we have nearly 20 people um, sitting down, listening to a, a speaker. Um, you know, those 20 people would normally have been standing around in the show hall. So you know, it's, it's, it's thinking about things to try and make the whole event worthwhile. And that's what we, we, we constantly keep trying to do. And, 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 and that's, uh, yeah, and you thought about it, and, and it's happened, isn't it? You've, you've seen it into fruition. And, uh, yeah, I can see that, you know, we've, again, people, we, as, there's, as the, we get, few, as we become um, fewer and fewer in, in terms of club numbers, we, people are going to have to travel further to the shows, aren't they? So if they're coming, it's got to be, we've got to offer them a good day. It's got to be worthwhile, otherwise they won't, they won't come. Well, I mean, exactly. And if you're, you're expecting people to turn up at half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and standing around for, for hours doing nothing, it's not really fair, is it? I mean, after the initial uh, bacon sandwiches and rolls have gone, those people are just, they're left high and dry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, so, um, so, so with the club, though, with Mid-Essex, um, I mean, what's the ethos of it? And would you say, because I, I know that, you know, the club has a lot of, has juniors there. I know quite late at night on their, at the, the club meeting, but they do get plenty, you get plenty of juniors, lots of ladies as well. Is that, was that, was that a conscious thing or is that just, I imagine it was rather than it just, it's just yeah, developed. It, 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 it was, it was an area where we, we had discussed it and, I think it's important to create um, a unisex club because so many of the, the bird uh, societies are, are referred to as a, a male-dominated affair. And to be honest with you, I think we're missing a trick here because there's a lot of breeders um, around the country uh, you've only got to look at the, the social media sites for the, if you like, the pet birds. There's a lot of ladies out there that are breeding and they can be encouraged to, to join class if you go about it the right way. I mean, if I get to hear of a, a lady who uh, um, and you on what have you, and one or two of the ladies have come to us that why um, and I think we need it. I think the ladies bring a different element to it and make it more lighthearted. Um, and I think this is one of the, 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 the reasons for the success of mid is because we've got a very young club, um, you know, notwithstanding me and a couple of others. The average age is probably in, in late 30s, early 40s. You can stop laughing, Ricky. Um, but it, it, it's, it's where you need, because the, the younger people potentially have got a little bit more drive, because the older people have been there, they've done it, this is the way they've always done it, and, you know, it's, it's, it's how it is, the traditionalists, if you like, and the younger people have got that little bit more enthusiasm, and that's what you need to inject into a club. You need to bring life into it. Um, and this is why I, I feel we're, we're really lucky in Ethics because we've got a, a fantastic
fantastic um, spectrum of people. Um, you know, got people that are, are really serious about the protocol because every club needs to have a protocol. Um, and you've got others that are a bit more light-hearted, and it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic combination. And everyone pulls together, and that's the nice thing about it. Everyone, you know, even the kids that come along at the evening, you know, they'll often pick up a broom or or help out clean the take the cups out. Or it's it's how people get involved, and that's the nice thing. So, okay, so I'm going to change change, change tack slightly. Um, I mean, we talked about fancies you you you've seen um, and and visited and bought birds from. Who who is it you admire most, um, or have had the most profound effect on you and your stud in, in your time within the hobby? We spoke about Gerald. Um, who, who else is there? Would you say is there one person that's really? Um... No, I mean you you there, there are so many top good breeders around the world and especially in this country there really is and every breeder has got their own line the top breeders have got their own lines and to really pick one out specifically you, you can't do it it wouldn't be fair on 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 others um I mean, there, there have been birds that have come into, into my bird room, which I've used. Um, I mean, a classic example, uh, seeing Kay uh, down in the South Coast, uh, Kevin John. Um, I bought four birds from him. Didn't want four birds, I only wanted one. But they came as a page. And the one that I really wanted didn't do anything for me. And one of the lesser birds I put to one of my... Um, my spangles, and I bred the most amazing spangles I've ever bred in my life. But that was never on the cards. But it's in the background of his birds. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's such a hard one, John. I mean, you can you could say Daniel Lutop, Mike Ball, Paul Stannard. You go on forever. The, 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 everyone out there. There's a lot of good breeds out there. What about? So what? Remind me. What was the name of the? Um... Of the of the first guy that got you started, it was he. Um, what was his name? Gerald Binks. Oh, no, 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 no. oh, sorry, Graham Fletcher. Graham Fletcher. Okay, so yeah, no, he he moved up to Cambridgeshire, and uh, unfortunately, he, he had to give him. I mean, he's still around, uh, and he was very good friends with uh, with um, Beverly Hart, and I oh. did. I understand they used to work quite closely together, but Graham had to give up his birds in the end. Um, I did try to get in touch with him a few years ago when I was going up to see Connor Hickman. He's up, he's up that way. Um, but no, it's uh, yeah, it's a shame. I'd like to have seen him again. But it's it's important as well as fancy is that we all when we when people do come through our doors that we give them as much sort of help and advice as we can really. That, that you all agree, won't you? And regardless of encouraging people to clubs, I think every fancier should be given the opportunity of a mentor. Um, I, I, I'd like to see a register of, of uh, breeders who are prepared to offer their services. You don't have to be you know, down with somebody in their burr room and what you can do like we're doing now. There's opportunities to do that in this day and age. But to have somebody like Graham Fletcher, like I have, um, well, I think it's invaluable. Because, you know, you have to learn by your mistakes otherwise. But to have somebody tell you about different pairing, what, what to do, what not to do, it's invaluable. You know, I, I think it's quite gratifying that now I've, I've got a few people that come on to me and they've got problems with, with their birds and they say, well, what, what do you think this is? Am I doing something wrong? Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I think it's... I think it's fantastic. If, if people could get into a mentoring situation, it's, it's certainly going to encourage more people forward. Because there's, there's people I know that have got birds that don't show. But if you were to lead them by the hand and say, come on, let's go to a show together, let's enter a bird room, see how you get on. I mean, I've seen it happen with a couple of ladies within Mid-Essex, really kind of, oh, no, my birds aren't going to be good enough. Well, one of the ladies, she put a bird into one of the um, um, the, um, the regional shows, as you call it, London Southern Counties. 
Um, and she won a CC. She, she, was, she was on cloud nine. And she just didn't give herself an absolute prayer. But she really is, it gave her a real buzz after that. But it's getting people to the point where they actually come along to a show. And that's where I meant to be at. Okay, so a couple of um, obligatory questions. So what seed mix do you feed and how? So are they fed separately? No. I, I, I don't have an awful lot of space in my flight, so I tend to put everything in one in one pot. Um, I used to give mine the 60-40, the, uh, the champion mix from uh, Countrywide, but I moved over to the Philorene mix. Uh, because it had a few other bits and pieces in there, a few uh, treats for the birds, and they seem to like it. Uh, I've not had any issues from it. So they get, they just basically get the, uh, the Phil Reaney mix. I don't tend to over, overdo it on the greens. Uh, they get the odd treat now and again. They get millet sprays. Other than that, the only soft food I give them is uh, grated carrot um, and groats, which are soaked. But, and I but, keep it very, very simple. But no supplements or anything in there? No. No, no. I've, I've never been able to do that. I, what, about, what about egg foods? Nothing like that in there? Or? Yes, I, I, I do put it in, but if you look at the egg food, it's most of it's biscuit in there. I do wonder how much goodness they're getting out of it. I've stopped it. I, I, used, to, I used to give it all to them. Uh, I've gone down the road of giving them various things like um, mealworm and what have you, but I just find it upsets their their, their systems. So um, I just keep it plain. It, it's funny, really, and, and, and what's behind this is my wife, because um, I I used to look at various products and, uh, and think, and I said, oh, I've got to try that. Uh, yeah, that, that looks really good. That's got to be good for my birds. And so... You know, my wife said, what's that kind of house? with a parcel. I said, well, she said, what's in it? I said, well, just, just something else I want to try. And she used to shake her head and walk away. And I think it was about two, two or three years ago, and I, I said to her, I just do not know what to do with my birds. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, it just doesn't seem to be happening for me. She said, well, stop giving them all the bloody rubbish you're giving them and just go back to where you used to be. I said, well, what, what do you mean? She said, well, look, you're buying this and you're buying that. Because she said, it's like a fisherman scenario. Half the time, there's all these new baits out there. She's convinced they're to catch the angler, not to catch the fish. And she's probably right. And I just wound it right in. I got rid of everything. And I just went back to a basic sea, back to how it used to be. And last year, not this year, but last year, I had the best breeding season I've ever had. Um, Coincidence? I don't know. But I've, my birds aren't suffering anymore because I'm not giving them all the supplements. They get mineral grip. I'll probably get a lot of abuse out of this and I should give them more. But, but yeah, they, but if, it, if get, it's working for you, but then, you know, if it's working, why, you know, why change it? So they, I think the birds will soon tell you if, if there's a problem or they're deficient or short in something, won't they? They're not all dropping off perch. I mean, they're, 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 they're all chasing around. There's, there's no problems there. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, so in terms of hurdles you've had to overcome in the breeding shed, I hope you don't mind me putting this question. Some people are always a bit um, hesitant in answering questions like this, where they say, oh, I don't have problems in my shed. Um, have, have, you, have you had anything that you've had to overcome, like severe French mould or other problems with the birds that you, you can, you're willing to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, livestock is livestock. You, you're always going to get issues, and you can't control that. Um, one of the, the major problems I suffer from is the humidity, especially um, in the wintertime. Um, I used to... Um, put uh, mineral sand down on the floor of my internal flight. And I noticed a few years ago that the, the sand had gone hard where the moisture, it was absorbing the moisture basically. Um, 
and my shed was just far too wet. The, because I've got a pop hole that's open 24-7, the air was coming in and the warm air from the shed was hitting it and condensation was forming. And I was creating the perfect environment for candida um, and chlamydia, uh, which are all thrush-related diseases. Uh, and thrush absolutely adores you know, a warm, humid atmosphere. And that's exactly what I created, this bioclimate, um, by what I was doing. Um, and I had horrendous problems. Um, and it's always around about December uh, that it kicks in. Um, and it took me a long time to, to actually find a way of combating it. Um, I'm still not convinced um, that uh, the main um, products on the market, my statin is, is good enough. Um, but the problem everybody has is there's, there genuinely is just not enough knowledge out there to help you. Um, if you go to your veterinary, um, unless they've got somebody that speci specifically specialises in avian uh, healthcare, then you, you haven't got a prayer. They, they really just don't seem to know. Um, and in the past, I uh, found a company over in um, Colchester called Belgica de, de Weird, who were primarily a pigeon um, company, uh, a veterinary company. They did some small birds, but not many. And I went under their wing, if you like, for the best part of two years, to try and get me away from the problems I was having. Um, and eventually, uh, I did get to grips with it. Um, and it was all by chance, actually. Um, it was, um, I can't remember his name, Dean Harding, Dean Harding up north. Yeah. Um, he said to me, you need to try and get hold of some doxycycline. Um, he said that um, if you've got thrush-related problems, that's what you need to get hold of. Um, and he sent me a link for a company overseas, and fortunately I managed to get some through. And he was absolutely spot on. The doxycycline really got hold of the problem. Not before I'd lost quite a few birds, quite a few good birds. Um, but at least I got to the bottom of it and started to break the back of it. Um, yeah, it's uh, that was a, a bit of luck because all the things I was trying with Belgica really weren't working at all. And I've since spoken to um, Kevin, Kevin Eatwell, uh, who's been very helpful and very supportive. Um, and he agrees also that uh, Dr. Sarkin is the best way forward. Because so, what are the symptoms, uh, Graham, of candida? Can you just explain? Well, yeah, it's... People who don't know. It's... it's the, the first um, is weight loss. And you often hear people saying, uh, oh, that's going to fight. Um, you can feel the breastbone really sh razor sharp. Um, that's not the first sign, believe it or not. There are signs that you can you can actually pick on before that. Um, because I've, I've literally fought this, as I said, for, for a few years now, I've, I've really got quite um, good at picking a bird up very early, which is the, the key. If you get one that's got it, you treat it, and, and obviously then you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna win the day. Um, but if you have a, a seed tray, um, you'll find that if a bird is suffering from any form of thrush-related illness, they will be constantly at the seed dish. And they won't just be on the edge where the rest of the birds might be. They'll actually get into the dish as well. Because what they're doing, they're scurrying around, trying to find the smaller seeds to crack. Because what candida does, and, and uh, chlamydia, in the throat, it actually closes the esophagus up. So the bird is starting to try to get smaller particles down into its, into its crop 
because the candida is down in there and what it's what is coming down it's eating it's growing on so it's a fighting battle for the bird one its throat's getting uh, closing up um, and also it's being eaten alive effectively from it's being starved from from inside because it's, it's, it's uh, not getting anything through the other sign is if you look at your seed dish when you uh, come to clear it up if you see lots of dust in the, in the bottom, you often people say, oh, I've, got, I've got this seed. And I, and I think about it now, people say, oh, I've got seed, and I'll dust you this seed. When you, when you go to throw it away, there's lots of dust in the bottom. And that is caused by the birds crushing the seed down fine to get down. So it's, it's an early warning signal. If you see these, these birds around the seed pot and they will keep coming back and another Another thing to watch out for is if you top up, they're always the first ones there. You'll get to see it. You'll get to recognise it. So that's the, that's the, that's the early warning. The next thing is, of course, the bird then becomes quite uh, critical because it hasn't been getting the food. It has got the body loss. You can feel the, the razor sharp. But that is not the end. You can bring them back as long as you treat them. But it's it's... It's with a lot of people, it's blind treating. They don't know what they're dealing with. They will go to their medicine cabinet, they can get hold of Baytril or, or whatever. All they do is give them antibiotics, which knock out what remaining kind of antibodies that the, the birds have got, and then, then they lose them. So you do really need to try and get hold of professional advice. Uh, if you want to save your birds, you spend a lot of money buying them. The last thing you want to do is just lose them. As, as a society, could we offer that something more to the members? Is there, I mean, I'm always trying to well, think of... I believe Kevin Eatwell is, is now more involved. And um, I, I think I read somewhere that you can send birds off now for analysis or you can certainly um, get him involved uh, quickly. He's very, very good. Mm. You know, he's straight down the line. Um, he doesn't suffer fools. If you... You know, he, he would rather you go to him and the word go rather than tell him what you've been trying because it's, you know, everyone blind troops. They always do. And I, I think it's so sad. You, know, you need to find the root cause. So, yes, I've, ha I've had problems with that. Um, I've also had issues with, uh, from time to time, ironically, deficiency in calcium. Um, I've had birds go lame. Um, cocks and hens, funny enough, um, even to the point where they've, they've lost the use of one side and, you know, you think they've had a stroke. And I've, I've heard people saying, oh, but this bird go lame, I've, I've, you know, I've had to dispatch it. No, 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 you've just got to think things through a little bit more. You know, why has it suddenly happened? Um, and I've found that in all cases that uh, I've had this problem, it's been down to calcium deficiency. And um, by using a little bit of um, liquid calcium, either by crop needle or just applied to the beak on a regular basis for a few days, the bird will suddenly pick up and get back to normal again. Because you did a brilliant article in Cage Birds on that little discovery as well, didn't you? Because you're quite right. People over the years say the bird's had a stroke. It's lost the use of its leg. So I've had to put it down. But I've had a couple. And since I've tried it, it does. It, you squish quite a lot of um, of calcium into them. And, it, and it's amazing. Two or three days and they're back fit as a fiddle, aren't they? And it's, uh... I mean, I've, I've even had a hen on eggs, uh, on chicks, where she literally crawled. And I mean, crawled, dragged herself into the nest box, and I felt so sorry for it. You know, I didn't even realise it was going on until it was too late. But uh, it wasn't too late in the end because I was able to treat it. But it was just so nice to see her back to normal again. You know, it's, you know I think we need to spend more time trying to look at our birds. And, and I think if you spend more time, you can save them. You can keep them. You can certainly keep them going longer. But candida, yeah, that's been a, a real issue with me. You know, I'm glad that, I'm glad I've got to the back of it now. I haven't had a case this year. Um, the only thing I've suffered from is a respiratory issue where I've had birds with weeping nostrils. Um, it's all linked, 
But when it was dry, um, I was getting youngsters that were getting it because obviously their immune system was not up at that point. Um, and I was losing babies. One minute they're fine, next minute they're gone. But again, you can treat that as something else that doxycycline uh, is quite effective for. Well, thank you for thank you for being so candid. I'm trying to hum my way through that, but thank you for being so candid with with that. We share sharing those experiences with us because I mean they're really important. I think uh, people watching the interview see just for that little nugget of information. It's uh, if they can take that away because uh, people here are candida, but um, I don't well, think people always explain what it is. The, the, the whole essence of it is that I'm using. By, by the atmosphere that I've created. And now I've realised that I now have a dehumidifier in there. So with the dehumidifier on, when I need it, I keep the, the moisture down. And also got to the point where I've changed the wire that I have to pick. So it's more absorbed and it's a lot easier. So uh, yeah, it's, it's about managing the, the climate you're keeping. It's quite important. You asked in the earlier about the most important bits. Well, one of the best things that was ever given to me, in fact, Ricky was the one that gave it to me, was a being temp. I built back after I got broken, but my goodness, how many of the problems you had here. Sorry, can you tell that again, Graham? You broke up slightly there. So, sorry, just repeat that last bit for me, sorry. <laughs> The most valuable that I've got in my first uh, humidity that uh, really very kind. And it's only a battery of plastic. It, it tells me when I need to pick the dehumidifier in to get my own. I can moderate the temperature and and uh, the humidity in the fur when it's needed. So, so in so in terms of medicines. You've talked about the doxycycline. Is there any other med medication you keep in your in your cupboard, in your medicine cupboard? That uh... oh, John, I've got so much uh, because I thought, you know, when I've had my issues over the years, I, um, I going through LG as an example, they gave me so many trying. I kept spending months trying. Uh, now, and it's not that I was doing it blindly, I was taking birds down and testing them, um, but I was doing the right thing, it didn't really cut it for me. So yes, I've got lots of things out of which I should probably throw most of them away. Um, but one thing that I, I wouldn't be, it's, it's something I can actually get from people there, because I have around them. They will prescribe, I think, the bird and the poor bird is massively strong. Um, a few issues, and I've had my fair share in the past. Um, sometimes it's induced by a feather getting caught, other times it's, it's seed or it could be a bit of dust, but it could be an infection. And I've tried the cold tea bags, I've tried cold night, uh, ointment, all manner of things. The only thing that works, I think that thing is Maxitrop. It's a brilliant uh, 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 eye drop. It really is. And it, it, it will cure it very, very quickly. To the point now, if I have any birds that have any eye, I've done it straight away and the problem's almost gone. Is that, is that over the counter, that stuff, or...? No, no, it's by prescription. But as I said, I took a bit of the vets, and on the basis that they have seen that I'm a, you know, I'm a breeder, and that I knew what I was looking for, they were happy to prescribe. And going forward, if I need a repeat prescription, they will issue it to me. Yeah, I think that's it's key to chum up with your local vet, isn't it? I know I've done with mine, and. It's not a case that once you've made contact and and they accept and they acknowledge that you you're quite serious about about breeding. You don't 
I find I don't even have to take the blurb down now. I ring right. them and say, this is what I need that Emily, who's my vet, looks it up and says, yeah, I can give you that. And then, and then just prescribes it. So she's, which is, and it's good to have done that before you need them as well. Well, I think I was very lucky. I, they had a locum in and he was an avian vet. And it was, uh, you know, going forward, I don't think I'd have had that copy again. He's there now. Um, I mean, anything I have now, I speak to Kevin and me as well. So I don't, uh, I don't advocate just uh, giving birds things for sake of it. You know, you, you root in things before you start playing around with, with medicines and antibiotics. As I said, if you do it good, you not So we we've um, we talked about Mid Essex and what they offer members. How how important? I mean, one of the one of the um, the, the the sort of novel things that the club brought in was having walkers attend periodically to buy members surplus birds. Um, yeah, that that sort that was whose idea was that? That was a, a real great innovation, and I know again members really value that service because they just they've only got to bring their their pairs of surplus birds along and, and they get paid and that's it. No visitors and the, bir the birds are away. So um, how did that idea come about, please? I think it came by chance, really, because um, I obviously approached the walkers with a, with a view to sponsorship for the raffle, because obviously with having birds out there um, and as Mid-Essex covers the Dilipos, um, I was trying to find an opportunity to at least get some deliveries done um, and uh, I'm sponsorship. And not only one day, but he said, I'm, I'm in need of some birds. Um, would your club members be able to get together and get some for me? Uh, and that's how it all started, really. Once you got over the, the shock, because obviously £7.50 a bird is, is not a lot when you bear in mind how much you have to feed uh, a bird uh, if you're buying one in. But it's of reducing your stock levels and getting some seed money in. Um, and so as a con to do it on a regular basis, and uh, I think we, we've had up to 300 birds uh, in one go go out, which is, which is amazing. The big difference is uh, you must know what it is to like you could your, um, your stock out. You know, the, the room in your shed is so much more noticeable. Um, and it helps. It helps. Yeah. And it's we, probably... We, what we, I was going to say, we, 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 we invite people to have a little auction. Um, and we give the opportunity to auction birds that um, they feel are worth a little bit more than £7.50. Um, and we have a bit of fun uh, on the club even. Those birds don't, don't go all good. The members get an opportunity to buy quality birds at a, at a reasonable price. And I think it's fair to say that members of Mid-Essex perhaps... Um ones who are just starting out have, have done very well for not a lot of money, haven't they, from, and, and oh, managed to obtain yes. some cracking birds. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we also try to, because we, we give those members the opportunity of, uh, as long as we've got the quota we need for walkers, which is about 100 birds, um, if members want to buy uh, a, a particular bird, uh, then we tell them to do so for £12.50. The member who selling it for £10 and the club for £2.50, which, you know, it's uh, everyone do it that way. The member gets the £7.50 and the club has got his money and the club has got a cracking bird in the process. Absolutely. Right, Graham, I've had you for chatting away for an hour 45. I think we're going to... Uh, We'll perhaps wrap it up there because we've all got work tomorrow and, uh, and, and you've given your time uh, as usual um, 
without complaint and, uh, and very generously. Um, on behalf of everyone at the Exhibition Buzzery Gar Forum, thank you very much indeed, Graham. Um, and uh, I wish you a very Merry Christmas, because we're not too far away from that now. And uh, obviously all, all the success in the future with your birds. And uh, yeah, we look, look forward to seeing you soon. But thank you very much indeed. Yeah, keep well, John. Thank you very much. All the best. Cheers, Graham. God bless. Bye-bye.